So our next speaker is my colleague Samuel Moyne, who's a professor of law and history at Harvard University. Sam has written several extraordinary books in the last decade on the history of human rights that I highly recommend you buy and read, especially the book, a book called The Last Utopia. Today he's going to speak to us on a topic that one does not hear enough of in Washington, how warfare became both more humane and harder to end. Sam Moyne. All right, well, thanks to the organizers and, and thank you all for lingering. Uh, so uh, in his, his 2015 farewell column in the Washington Post, uh, where he covered national security for 40 years, Walter Pincus recalled a cutting remark that a CIA contact made just a year into the war on terror. We've turned 16 clever Al-Qaeda terrorists into a worldwide movement, seemingly more dangerous to Americans than the communist Soviet Union with the thousands of nuclear missiles. And then we set out to fight phantoms of our own imaginations, bringing about fearsome enemies we never had, entering a spiral of endless fighting from which there is no end in sight except our own choice to reset. Now, I start very bluntly in this way because I think we have to acknowledge that whenever we talk about legal interpretation, we are really doing politics by other means. Our understanding of whether and how law does and should constrain the war on terror is not going to be separable from our opinions about whether this war is a good idea in the first place, whether it's ethically just and not simply legally proper. Uh, even as we hand our endless war now over to someone who gives no sign to us that she's going to be inclined to take any different of you about how she prosecutes it, except escalation. But let's bracket those big questions uh, and suppose a real threat to American soil or Americans abroad. And let's grant for the sake of argument that the threat's serious, although, as the last panelists have just mentioned, uh, it doesn't account for many deaths compared to guns and fast food. Uh, with due allowance, which we should make, for indigenous radicalization, although it's very unclear uh, whether our foreign activities are deterring that radicalization or uh, exacerbating it. Uh, but let's assume the foreign threat, and what I want to focus on is how we've dealt ourselves a bad legal hand uh, and why we should want our next president to fold it rather than double down. So what I'm going to argue is that our military engagements over the past 15 years have been humanized uh, in the limitations we've learned to place on our targets and methods, even as these engagements threaten to become unlimited in time and space. Now, I'm going to use the words clean and humane and hygienic to describe our war. If you like, there are scare quotes, or quotes around my, those adjectives for the rest of the talk. All I mean is that we've made a novel form of fighting that is effectively, although not perfectly, brought in line with the humanitarian standards of fighting that go back several decades. Uh, so we live in a world of humane war, more humane war, uh, but also endless war. And I want to make sense of that and how law connects to it. Because legal interpretation, along with many other factors, has played a central role in enabling this result, humanity and endlessness. It's not a story about more or less constraint. It's about both at the same time along different axes. Roughly an exchange has been made. Wars have become more unbound in their initiation and their continuation, less constraint, on condition of being more humane, more restraint when it comes to their prosecution. We've humanized but not pacified. Now, it's not the current president's uh, doing it alone. Uh, but war that, like ours, is more like policing 
a permanent institution, uh, except it's for the globe uh, and under much uh, less significant legal constraint, is a bequest that no one's done more than the current president to give to the next one. Clean and endless war, I want to make clear, is not without some good points or virtues, but its vices are ones that I think a, a number of actors, for their own reasons, have overlooked. And the ultimate question, which I get to at the very end, uh, is whether there's hope to change the equation and the result we've reached. So I want to proceed in three steps. First, I just want to sketch very briefly how humane and endless war came about, and in particular, how it served a variety of constituencies in what you might see as a convergence of interests. Second, I'll turn to law and legal interpretation, and specifically international law, where the dynamic of constraint and unbinding is most graphic. And then finally, I'll ask if there's a dark side to the bargain uh, that we've made what we might have lost or put at risk, even though, as I say, we can't expect Hillary Clinton to do anything other than make what I think is a bad deal worse. So I start with humane and endless war. It's not uh, this war on terror of ours, not just the longest war in American history, as Professor Goldsmith said right at the start of the day. I think it's been the most humane major conflict any state's ever conducted in the history of warfare. Now, this is for some an outrageous claim, and, and I, it might not be correct. All that matters for my purposes is that war in our time, and especially counterinsurgent war, has undergone a big transformation over the past half century, especially, and is now fought with a level of humanity, a lack of brutality uh, that prior generations would have rejected as unnecessary, or once they uh, got a conscience about it, would have considered impossible to achieve. Now, I'm not trying to downplay the inhumanity of our wars, um, but I think we should classify that inhumanity that remains in one of three categories for the most part. First, superseded mistake that actually, when we look at it, confirms how far we're going towards humane war. Second, unintended collateral that goes along with any military intervention, no matter how humane it is. And third, the inevitable residue of the attempt to humanize war in our time. So let me explain these three kinds of um, inhumanity that remain, just so it's clear what I'm talking about. Clearly, at the beginning of the war on terror, there were divergences from the trend to humanize warfare that America uh, committed. John Yu, if there's a script that, that uh, was leading us towards humane war, didn't get it. Uh, and uh, yet, it seems to be more significant in the cold light of history that pushback arose so early within the prior administration, and that one could even worry that we played into a, a kind of diversion by focusing so much on quickly contained, although thoroughly outrageous, crimes of war like torture, while something much darker has continued, including under the current president. Torture is a superseded mistake, and it ended but humane war continues with no end in sight. Second, uh, I said there's collateral, unintended violence that goes along with war by definition. So there's been lots of disorder and civil war no matter where we've intervened, and most obviously in Iraq with large death tolls following. But it's important to recall some important facts. Many <laughs> civilians have died. Uh, uh, in the uh, global war on terror, but not because they've been directly targeted. Actually, few have died for that reason. Uh, and this is actually the reason why uh, our ancestors put strict constraints on what lawyers called use ad bellum, the right of a state to go to war in the first place. 
we've worked much more on the other side, a use in bellow, a constraining how it is we fight, but forgetting that whenever a war is allowed to begin, there will be lots of collateral deaths from disorder that will often follow. Uh, and that's true above all, I think very clearly, of our light footprint, so-called, often more accurately, no footprint form of war in our time. And then third, uh, that last category I mentioned, uh, the inevitable residue <laughs> of violence. We've killed people uh, because the laws of war allow us to not target civilians, but kill them in the course of targeting our enemies, a fully legal a thing to do. And so there's going to be, even in the most humane form of warfare, um, a lot of, of violence. No regulation of the way that war is fought will ever eliminate bad apples, and it won't eliminate uh, honest mistakes, and it will allow a lot, a lot of collateral violence. So clean and endless war, uh, in my uh, conception, is, is just clean enough. It's been clean enough for us. It's not that it's nonviolent, far from it. It's a deal that was struck to reach a clean enough form of war. How did it come about? I think that's the interesting question because it's so unprecedented. And my answer is going to be interest convergence uh, along with technological change. It served the powerful uh, and it served our current spokespeople for the weak, namely human rights movements. So let me explain. Uh, states have faced unprecedented new challenges, the United States uh, uh, most of all in its war making. Uh, uh, and it learned that it would serve its interest in pursuing a war to make it more humane so as to continue it indefinitely. Uh, a non-humane warfare in Vietnam and then again immediately after 9-11 caused serious threats to war's legitimacy. Clean war does not. More interestingly, the military uh, is willing to fight clean war, and it can. You may remember the journalist Jane Mayer of The New Yorker who wrote many articles about torture uh, uh, in the years after 9-11. She also wrote a very revealing one about the commandant of West Point who flew to Hollywood to beg the producers of 24 to stop glamorizing torture. No better example I know about of a military acting to try to keep civilians and civil society uh, in bounds, when for many generations the challenge was civilians keeping the military under control. But now it turns out that souped up militaries do not need to fight dirty wars if, they're, uh, uh, if, if they have the right equipment. So that leaves the interesting case of the human rights movement. Now, anti-war movements in this country were once far more prominent than human rights movements, but no more. Uh, and anti-war movements were prominent in part because states and militaries still fought dirty. Now they don't. Uh, and human rights movements uh, have taken a different tack. Actually, sometimes, as in the case of the late Michael Ratner of, the, um, uh, of, a, of a very well-known NGO, um, they have roots in, in anti-war activism, but strangely, their legacy today is to help the state and the military humanize their wars in the convergence that was addressed earlier. Sometimes human rights activists have argued for war, as in the case of humanitarian intervention. Um, but more often, they've used information, naming and shaming, to target not the legality of going to war, but uh, the uh, crimes of fighting it, if you like the, not war as a crime, but crimes of war. And they did this for a number of reasons. They wanted to pose as apolitical. You heard Hina Shamsi respond angrily earlier uh, to Ben Wittes to the effect that she's not on the left, she's not partisan. And this fits with a very deep uh, a genetic code in human rights movements that um, they claim neutrality. They speak from above politics. 
uh, and fair enough, but that means you can't speak against wars. Um, it makes it more difficult. Um, and I think more importantly, after 9-11, human rights movements knew that they could not fight the early response to uh, the 9-11 attacks uh, and the rise of the national security and surveillance state. So they chose a, a, a lesser ambition. It would be enough to keep war clean, even if they couldn't keep uh, a, a patriotic response uh, w with some hysteria in the mix from happening. And so strangely, humanitarians joined their old adversaries, states and military, in bringing about this bargain. Okay, so now I turn to my second theme, international law, what happened to it? I think what happened uh, was the loss of what had been international law's highest priority, control of force in the international system. Uh, and that's because, I think in part, many actors believed it was going to be okay to fight wars precisely because it was now possible for them to fight them cleanly. This is a new view. Our ancestors thought if you care about war crimes, you stop war uh, because war involves war crimes. You can, uh, if you like, stop war crimes, but it doesn't mean you stop war. Uh, so I'll uh, read you a quotation from the most famous law professor of the middle of the 20th century named uh, Herbert Wexler. I think he was kind of the leading law professor of the time who says, once the evil of war has been precipitated, Nothing remains but the fragile effort to limit the cruelty by which it's conducted. Of these two challenges, who will deny that the worst thing is the unjustified initiation of the war? So you see clearly there he cares about war because the greater war includes the lesser war crimes. We changed that view. We've uh, focused on <coughs> war crimes but not war itself. Um, uh, and the human rights community has, I think, fit in, in this troubling result. Maybe for some understandable reasons, but I hope they can't last. Um, and the human rights community, um, uh, since obviously the continuation of war has served states and militaries, uh, has nonetheless stood by in relative silence as constraints uh, on going to war in the first place have been eroded. Um, so uh, this, this is, I think, one of the most remarkable phenomena of the era since roughly 1989. There seems to be some kind of hydraulic relationship between crystallizing <coughs> constraints on fighting dirty and whittling away on constraints on fighting in the first place. Uh, and we have to see not just states and militaries, but our, our humanitarian movements as part of how that result happens. Um, now, uh, I'll add just in passing that it's been central to the human rights movement as well, of course, to open the road to the use of force by certain states. And if you uh, want an example of this, you have no better one than a professor Harold Coe, who's made very clear that uppermost for anyone who cares about human rights is giving the United States more capacity, more legal grounds on which to go to war. Okay, so let me tell a brief story about what's happened to international law in particular as this strange shift has occurred. This crystallization of constraints on how we fight, coupled with erosion of constraints on whether we can go to war. Now most of us, especially in this town, would rather talk about domestic law, uh, red meat topics like Article II or the War Powers Resolution. And we could say a lot about those because they've been eroded too. Those are the domestic constraints on going to war. But I'd rather look at international law because it's there that we see the most graphic version of the picture I'm trying to lay out. 
Uh, so um, briefly, uh, especially under the current administration, international law constraints on going to war have been eroded in a series of major respects. So we should start, just to go back, um, with a lot of controversies that took place at the very beginning of the era of war on terror uh, concerning whether you're allowed to declare a legal war in self-defense against a non-state actor. You remember Mary DeRosa mentioned that controversy in her talk. And obviously, that's a decision uh, that the Bush administration made, but that the current president, and for that matter, the next one, um, are, uh, uh, aren't going to change. There's also this a very important issue of the concept of associated forces um, with a domestic law allowing um, uh, the war on terror to pursue affiliates of Al Qaeda, but there's no corresponding category in international law which would allow the extension of a legal war against one entity to another. That's also been ignored. Now consider a second area, just briefly, um, the a constraint that requires you to act in self-defense against a threat, uh, suppose, supposing you can act against a non-state actor, only when the threat is imminent. Very graphically, um, for example, when, um, when we went after al-Shabaab from two in North Africa from 2012 on, um, we've seen a fairly significant in, um, undermining of the constraint of that, uh, that we, we strike only against the most imminent threats. But what I want to talk about at, at slightly greater length, I think the most revealing uh, example of the undermining of the constraint on going to war, on initiating and continuing war, is a constraint um, uh, 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 that um, has um, been most in play in, in our bombing of Syria in the past couple of years. So I'm referring um, to uh, the rise of a doctrine um, under the current administration uh, uh, called the unwilling and or unable doctrine. And if you don't know, it's, it's a doctrine that says if a state abroad can't control uh, actors on its territory, terrorists uh, cited in this case in Syria, if it's unwilling and or unable to control terrorists, it gives right, a rise to a right of intervention. Um, that's not illegal, according to this theory under the UN Charter. And we've seen people argue for this doctrine, which is the doctrine that allowed the United States to begin bombing Syria a couple of years ago. One law professor, uh, for example, has amassed a lot of, of alleged precedents that, uh, that show that states can intervene against non-state actors when the state that's hosting them is, uh, is unwilling or unable to, to, um, to, to keep them um, from posing threats. Um, I have lots of problems with the precedents that have been cited. One is the U.S. intervention against Cambodia uh, in the midst of the Vietnam War, which is not, I think, a very savory precedent to call upon to justify uh, later conduct. But more interesting is the way in which supporters of this doctrine massage the precedents. Um, for this doctrine to hold, it has to be the case that there's a general and consistent will, uh, practice of states uh, to allow this interpretation of Article 51 of the UN Charter. Uh, and in fact, there's not. Most states are on record as rejecting this interpretation of the UN Charter precisely because they want to keep states uh, from going abroad militarily. And yet, we've done it anyway. Most interesting, I think, is that the United States relies very publicly on this doctrine. And after it entered Syria, uh, got some of its longstanding allies, um, if not to change their minds, then to rely on it too in joining. So you may know that states like Australia, France, and the United Kingdom were not 
willing to go after Syria uh, uh, under this doctrine. It might be that they um, didn't uh, denounce it, uh, but they didn't join that part of the coalition. And it seems as if their skittishness about this doctrine must have been one of the reasons. And yet what we've seen is that in part because of the Paris attacks, all three of those states are now in Syria. Uh, and they've declared that this doctrine, uh, the unwilling and unable doctrine, um, is good law to them. It justifies their presence abroad. Now, what do we make of this little episode? Um, for some, it adds to the number of states that support it, and therefore to the crystallization of, of um, a, new, a new kind of law in the international system. I think it teaches something else. Uh, it teaches us that powerful states like the United States get to make the rules. Uh, they break them first, and they make new ones in doing so. And that's bad behavior that other states then follow, and that's exactly what's happened. Weak states still oppose this doctrine because they don't want their sovereign territory subject to intervention. Strong states are tending to side with the United States. And so this all, I think, fits in a pattern. Uh, we've seen these uh, rules about how we fight, the cleanliness of our fighting crystallize. And amazingly, the Obama administration, uh, in spite of lots of criticism, has sometimes insisted upon the importance of these rules. Um, there's a very well-known case called Albihani versus Obama, in which the DC circuit judges in this town said that the international law of how you fight doesn't constrain the president. The president's lawyers responded that it does. And yet the very same president has acted in serial ways to undermine the rules about whether he can go to war in the first place. That's troubling. Now, it might not be troubling. I'm now on my third uh, a set of worries about what, what's wrong with this picture or the dark side. It, there might not be one if it were just a matter of protecting Syria uh, and the Syrian state from intervention. Uh, and again, I'm not raising these concerns because it's at all predictable that the next president is going to change the equation. Uh, we've seen a Chilcot report in the United Kingdom investigating how it happened that that country joined the Iraqi intervention. That is unimaginable in this country. And as we heard from uh, the first speaker, uh, our next president is likely to be more aggressive and militaristic in pushing the envelope uh, with all of these doctrines uh, than, than not. And yet, there is this dark side. It's been mentioned, but it, I, I think it should be mentioned again um, first, there are just moral qualms about life and death decisions about taking people's lives, especially when, even if it's in a good cause, the likely uh, uh, scenario is disaster after the fact. The reason why our ancestors, in, when they made the UN Charter, when they held the Nuremberg Trials, uh, wanted to constrain force is all this bad stuff that can happen uh, as a result of war. Uh, even if it doesn't rise to the level of war crimes. And, and it's that lesson I think we've forgotten. And even if you're not troubled by what's happening to people in the rest of the world or what might happen under the next president or her populist challenger in, to, in, in 2020, you ought to be concerned about other actors around the world. Uh, a rising China now has the right uh, to fight its counterinsurgencies as a global hegemon in the future, uh, the way America has fought its global counterinsurgency. And there will be little ground for us to oppose the results on our record. All we will be able to do is beg the Chinese to fight clean. Okay, so let me uh, give a brief conclusion. I wanna be clear that humane war is better than the reverse, it has its virtues. What we can't say is that 19th century dreamers who thought that humanizing war would end it um, uh, 
are seeing their dreams fulfilled today. First of all, the rules they made to humanize war leave room for so much violence, legal violence. Uh, second, we've now learned, but this is just a lesson in our own time, that humanizing war can make it more consensual and endless. Uh, and so if you believe in humanizing war, you're, you can't believe anymore that it contributes to the pacification of the world, just the contrary. Um, is there a, a bright side to this dark side? I'm not sure. I, I would like to say there is. Um, it's hard to believe that Americans uh, are going to stand up in the absence of a, a draft, um, even if they watch the endless news cycle and conclude themselves that the, the, the war is self-defeating, bringing about uh, further enemies uh, rather than pacifying the world. Possibly there are signs that the human rights movement is positioning itself uh, to avoid what it's been lately, uh, an enabler of endless war, uh, inadvertently. As I mentioned, some of its affiliates, especially if they plan to serve in government, uh, uh, may want to put most emphasis on preserving the right of humanitarian intervention uh, as a carve out from the old uh, regime of using force in the world under the UN Charter. But I think many others in the uh, human rights movement um, now want to free themselves from the collusion, a tactical one, that they entered with states and militaries. Um, because for them, uh, endless war is not a result they planned or wanted. Uh, now, they can't become, shouldn't become an anti-war movement, but that doesn't mean that they need to uh, play the same role they've played in the rise of clean and endless war. Uh, so I'll end with a, a quotation from a, one of our leading generals until recently, General John Allen. Uh, you uh, know he's a friend of Hillary because if you watch the Democratic Convention, you saw him on stage there. Uh, at the end of his time fighting ISIS, he said, we need to get to the left of the symptoms of terrorism and solve the underlying circumstances. If we don't, we're gonna be condemned to fight war forever. forever. Now, this is, I think, a, a marginal comment. Uh, it's more rhetoric than anything else. Uh, and the question is how to take it more seriously. There are so many forces arrayed against changing the equation we've reached uh, whether it's an apathetic public, the need to justify defense or surveillance budgets, or the need to placate the base with aggressive action. So there's, there's I'm sorry to say, precious little reason to hope that the next president will do other than the current one. She's going to test the limits of law and intensify our strategy of humane war over the short term, but maybe uh, in the long term, it can reverse. And you may ask, and I'll close this way, when the long term comes, when the short term ends and the long term arises. Uh, and the truth is, I don't know, but I give an answer. It's an answer uh, that uh, I, of which I got a reminder last week, and you can interpret it as you like. The answer is blowing in the wind. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, Professor Goldsmith. You can call me Jack. Okay. Um, Sam, I just want, I want to ask you more about the origins of the human rights movement, the, 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 the move away from the anti-war movement. And I think Ratner is the most, is an interesting example because as you alluded to, he, he was the uh, president, I believe, of the Center for Constitutional Rights. He was a 70s war protester, a leftist, radical, anti-war person. He spent the 80s litigating against uh, all of the wars of the 80s and the 90s. And um, so he was, I think it's fair to say, a leading anti-war activist of the type you say we're missing now. Yeah. Um, and then, I'm just fleshing out what you said, and then his organization became 
after 9-11, the main organization that I think humanized war in the type the ways you're talking. Now, he said, he has said, before he died, he said that he, you know, I think even before 9-11, they had kind of given up on the, the anti-war movement. They'd gotten their heads pounded for 20 years. They'd just gotten nowhere with it. And I think that they had kind of, that the movement had kind of sputtered out um, even before 9/11, and then I think he also think, and you alluded to this, that maybe the type of litigation that they went into, habeas corpus, detention, um, interrogation, and the like, I think he actually believed at the beginning that would be the the uh, the way to end war. That if you made it humane enough, I think they actually had a theory that it might careful, <laughs> that it might end. And yet I think they woke up one day and they found that they had legitimated it. And I think he, in particular, had serious regrets. So I'm just wondering if you agree with that story, but then the question is, what is the basis for your hope that there's going to be, and that there's going to be a cleavage within this movement to, to go more in the anti-war direction? You, you alluded to that, but I don't right. really know what you're talking about there. Okay, excellent. Um, so, no, uh, I think you're right that Michael Ratner illustrates the, the, the trajectory. I mean, I think we can go back uh, and think, you know, in, in, in more historical ways, and I'm, I'm basically a historian, um, it's quite striking to me that the, there was no human rights movement in the era of the Vietnam War. There was an anti-war movement, uh, and the Vietnam War in itself didn't cause a human rights movement to come about. Um, there, there was consciousness of the law of war, but in part because there was no John Yoo in the Vietnam War who denied the applicability of the, of the Geneva Conventions to the conflict, in a way, um, people didn't fixate on that. Um, uh, uh, and, 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 and yet the human rights movement, I think, emerged primarily um, amongst the Democrats uh, in the aftermath of, of George McGovern's disastrous defeats. So that, I think we have to go back and just remember that there were paths open for the Democratic Party because this comes back to your, your, your question about the future. Um, at the time, the paths were seen as unviable. Uh, McGovern's defeats were so catastrophic that the Democratic Party decided, and, and then we get Hillary Clinton very quickly, actually, um, that it, it needed to be part of the national security establishment that had, had existed since the inception of the Cold War. And that's, that's sort of the rest of history all right there. Now, I, th I think the last, this current election cycle is interesting, not least because um, the, the, the McGovernite uh, a wing of the Democratic Party turns out not to be dead after all. Um, now, that's not to say that it controls it, it lost. Uh, and we have a militarist, uh, I think you know, many of us would fear, um, who's going to become the president. Um, very much not in a McGovernite spirit. Um, I, I, I'm sensitive to the worry that the career of someone like Ratner actually illustrates that we have to accept the result. He struggled for so long uh, uh, that there, the, his, his actions are kind of object lessons in what happens if you resist the riptide of history towards this result. But I'm not, I'm not sure. So first of all, um, you know, it's the, the, the battle over the identity of the Democratic Party is not over. But more important, I see a lot of people in the human rights movement that I meet um, very nervous about where liberal internationalists like Anne-Marie Slaughter, Harold Coe, et cetera, have taken the foreign policy of the country and will take it again under Hillary Clinton. And they want to avoid having human rights become, in retrospect, something that helped America keep um, its, um, you know, its, its freedom to intervene anywhere alive so long as it was done cleanly. So I think there's, there's, there's consciousness that there were, there were paradoxical effects to the way that Michael Ratner ended up living his life. And, and, and people like Hina Shamsi are still, um, still fighting. And the question is, you know, is there a social movement basis that would, 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 would take a different direction in light of some of these lessons? I agree that 
there's, there's the, the reasons to hope are slender, um, but then, you know. We also, especially the one you mentioned, also the, the draft. Yes. That was a big, big part of Vietnam. And it, it really was. It really was. In terms of understanding that. I think that's true. I, I think that's true. I think that's true. Um, so if, if you believe that the, the upheavals of the 60s and, and, and the critique of the Vietnam War were primarily selfish acts um, to defend one's own body or that of one's husband or brother or son, then you're going to be even more pessimistic. Uh, but I wouldn't reduce, I wasn't there, but I wouldn't reduce oh, it. Yeah. So, but it's, it's, a, it's a big, it's a, no, it's a big, it's a big factor. I, the, what all I can say is that um, I think that, you know, we talked about consensus earlier, and my, the remark I have about the idea that we've reached a stable consensus is that it's certainly a consensus in this town, and it can, it's a consensus among certain kinds of elites. Um, but, you know, it, it doesn't reach that deep, I think, and that means it can be shaken. And more than that, even in the Beltway, there's more and more consciousness that our strategies have been self-defeating. Um, they're, they're creating more enemies, not fewer, bringing more endless counter-terror, not um, any end in sight. Now, of course, that serves certain constituencies, um, i.e. the military-industrial complex, so-called by the Republican president, Dwight Eisenhower. But, it, it, for, but for, for other kinds of strategists, especially those who care about the effects of our choices around the world, um, there, there may be other insights available. Yes, sir. Warren Coates, I am not a historian, so I'm really, you know, coming at this from way out, outside. But it had never occurred to me before that championing human rights had much of anything to do with sort of the neocon vision of militarizing our foreign pol policy. Right. And you, you've merged them. Do, I, I don't see why they have to be merged. I mean, championing human rights uh, does not necessarily ever have to have anything to do with military force. Agreed. No, that's, that's important, and, and I, I would never argue for, for merging human rights to neoconservatism. Actually, it's very interesting when we go back to the 70s when the human rights movement gets started <laughs> that there were left and right versions of it. Um, so from the beginning, there were the Scoop Jackson Democrats uh, who were going to cross over from the Democratic Party into the Republican Party, just as they may do now again, given the support of people like Robert Kagan for Hillary Clinton. Um, their view was that human rights could be a way of um, pursuing communism under a new label. Um, and later, they, they did a lot with the idea of democracy promotion, and human rights were central to the idea of spreading democracy. But there's, so there's no need to make an argument that, that human rights are the same as neoconservatism. Um, in the guise in, in which human rights have taken amongst American liberal internationalists, there's much more of a resemblance um, because human rights tend to be about seeing American power as a beneficent force for the spread of human rights, including in and through military action. And there's just not much daylight between that vision and neoconservative democracy promotion. However, I would insist that that's a rare view now in part because um, our humanitarian interventions have been so dreadful in their consequences, and, and human rights communities understand the need to avoid collusion uh, with, with great power agendas. Now, they don't have a lot of answers about what it would look like to promote human rights around the world um, when, when you don't have good um, tools to do so, um, uh, except for for grassroots penetration and alliance. But um, I think I, I just wanted to make a case that there was a kind of um, convergence between human rights and these other forces. And mainly um, for the very understandable reasons that anyone who cares about human rights wants war 
to the extent it continues to be humane. And so that's what they worked on. But they didn't work on war itself, and so it's endless, albeit humane. Yes, in the back. Uh, like anticipatory self-defense, unable or unwilling test, and so forth, yes. are eroding uh, Article 2.4 of the Charter. So I'm just wondering, at what point in time do you think Article 2.4 was working well? Uh, before these doctrines came along, uh, was it working no. well? Because I think a lot of people would say it was just violated blatantly sure. since it was first uh, put forward. And some of these doctrines are actually attempts to try to discipline uh, when force can be used rather than just uh, have the violations that would routinely occur before. Thanks. I think that's a fantastic point. And of course, you know, in, in my contrast of Vietnam and today, I'm insisting that Vietnam was a much worse, much more brutal war, far more torture, even though there was no movement against torture and so forth. Um, and so there's no reason to, to get nostalgic or, or romanticize the past or anything like that. However, um, there, there, there's still the 1945 text of the treaty, which before the Cold War began, was imagined to provide a durable um, uh, world order focused on peace, not justice. Um, that was the original understanding of the United Nations Charter, to constrain force to the extent uh, uh, possible, precisely because of this view that to the extent you keep war from happening, you keep war crimes from happening. Um, so that's why that you find this strange fact that when we look back at Nuremberg, they're not talking about the Holocaust. They're talking about Hitler's bringing war to Europe, because if had that not happened, no Jews would have died, etc. cetera. Um, so, um, uh, but I, I guess I'll say that um, there's 1945 and then there's 1989, when there was a thought that after all the, the, the terrible, sordid history of the Cold War, there was going to be a reset. And yet, the reset was not in terms of peace, but justice in the form of human rights. Uh, and so what we've seen since 1989 is much less work on a peaceful world and much more work on a, a just world, if you like. Um, and, and the sad thing is that, that's, that that idea of justice in the form of human rights has often meant either authorizing wars in the name of humanitarian intervention, or once they've been authorized, focusing on keeping them pretty. Uh, and th that's a good thing, but it's just limited. Uh, and so um, I, 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 your point is absolutely important. If you're a fatalist and you accept that the fact of states engaging in war and the whole history of the world is, is a fait accompli that we can't manage, you have to face the fact that it has been managed to some very remarkable degree with the decline of interstate war in the past half century in spite of the Cold War and in spite of um, the war on terror. Uh, and so. Uh, the, the fear is, is about erosion from a baseline, and um, the fear is about um, inhibiting progress towards some, you know, some, some better situation. Yes. No, uh, you. Yeah. Well, very provocative. I'm having a trouble following your theme of the conversion of human rights groups from a anti-war focus to a making war humane focus. Okay. I've worked for decades with the Center of Constitutional Rights, and their common theme is constitutional rights. Sure. It's true that Ratner was very involved, as was said, in uh, some of the post-9-11 litigation. But for me, the human rights groups like Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, and an analogous sense, analogous sense for domestic, the ACLU, uh, are focused on acts by government internally. They were primarily focused on human rights denials by dictatorships and so forth. 
uh, and even with regard to the actions after 9-11, with regard to torture, which is the original emphasis, that related to the U.S. violation of its commitment as a signatory to the Declaration on Human Rights. So I didn't think of the human rights groups as basically anti-war groups. I was familiar with the anti-war groups, and I don't quite understand your theme, which stresses sort of a conversion of them from anti-war to human to making war humane. So uh, the the main argument was that um, it was about the focus of, of 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 groups like the the Center for Constitutional Rights. Um, I, I I think it's. Okay, fair enough. Civil libertarian and, and human rights groups, but you can put Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the leading, um, you know, human rights NGOs in the world. One with a global presence, and the other, you know, a, a New York based, but also today global, um, a human rights outfit. And I guess I would I would beg to differ that these groups um, were not um, really even primarily focused on the rights of Americans. Um, except uh, w once the Snowden uh, no, revelations. I, I didn't make myself okay, sorry. With regard to Amnesty and yes. yes. I did not think of them ever as primarily or substantially anti-war groups. Oh, okay. To pro protesting against violation of human rights internally Correct. by dictatorships in various Correct. Countries. No, okay. Well, then we agree. And the question then is why why do we have that project so strong in the present day without any anti-war um, group uh, to match it? Uh, so if you look back in U.S. history or even broader Western history, actually um, peace movements were much more popular than anything resembling human rights or civil liberties movements. Uh, and so the worry is that we've the, the groups we have left, um, which are honorably pursuing their focus, um, ha are, are not pursuing the big picture. And that might be a fine thing. But the big picture still matters, uh, which is that we've, we've seen them f a focus so substantially on how we're fighting the war, including in our treatment of foreigners, um, that we've, we've, we've lost much public discussion of and we don't have NGOs focused on the erosion um, of the state's uh, uh, legal, legally claimed rights to intervene uh, uh, to start uh, and continue war. If you don't like my explanation, uh, uh, which may be faulty, uh, and especially in its emphasis on human rights groups, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to, to concede some, some, some difficulties, but I would just suggest that we need to explain where we have collectively ended up, which is relatively clean war uh, with, with some criticisms left to make that shows no sign of ever abating. That's the result we've made for ourselves, uh, and that has to be explained. Uh, and uh, yes? Oh, it's got to stop, okay. Thank you very much. So you're all wondering, who's this guy you haven't seen all day cutting off our last speaker? I'm Doug Sylvester. I'm the dean of the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. And you know, for those of you who've been here since this morning or have joined us at other sessions, I hope you'll agree that our speakers have been profound, provocative, and tremendously insightful. Um, but I'm a dean, so my comments will be obsequious, uh, <laughs> self-promotional, and most importantly, incredibly brief. Obsequious because I really just want to come up and say thank you to our partners, in particular the New America Foundation, uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter and the entire team. And I've got names, I gotta make sure to thank uh, Ellen Alpa and John Williams for their tremendous work. You know, it's such a great uh, opportunity for us to collaborate and bring events like this together. And so uh, it's wonderful to have them involved with us. Uh, the McCain Institute of Arizona State University has been wonderful with Liz Fontaine and her team. Uh, couldn't put this together without them as well, so thanks to all of them. Obviously, my colleagues uh, at the university, it's been great to see a number of the ASU law faculty here. Um, so a bunch of them have asked questions. I hope you get a chance to see them. 
and uh, in particular to my team, Andrew Janes, David Campbell, and Emmeline Fox for all you did to put this event together as well, so thanks to all of you. Um, so that is uh, the overall thanks, uh, and then also, I'm sorry, to Jack Goldsmith. Uh, I want to make sure that this is for Martha, the Goldwater Visiting Chair at Arizona State University this year. So thank you, Jack, for helping us put this together and taking on an even larger event in the spring. I really hope that gets tweeted out uh, at some point. Um, and then it's self-promotional, uh, not really about me, but about the program. I don't know if people know, but uh, Arizona State University has been in D.C. for more than a decade. The law school is entering into its ninth year uh, of a program that's been run largely by Professor Ord Kittry. Uh, who's been here for a number of years running a program for our students to become uh, engaged in federal agencies, international agencies, getting them great jobs. And now we're incredibly proud to have the uh, Rule of Law and Governance program with Ambassador Clint Williamson and Julia Fromholtz. Um, for those who don't know, we're going to have over 20 students here this spring uh, spending an entire semester learning about the Rule of Law and Governance, co coming to events like this. Um, but it's not just the, I think, tremendous opportunities that our students get by coming here to D.C. It's also having events like this and educating our students back in Tempe. Uh, I know this is being simulcast uh, back in Phoenix. We're in Phoenix now, I know. Uh, we just moved into a fabulous new building. Hopefully you'll all come and see it. Uh, but they're watching as we speak. And so we are really a university in different places at the same time, teaching on really important topics. I mean. These kinds of events are not just ideas. This has been a really thoughtful, again, very provocative, bipartisan, uh, in-depth, and complex. Uh, it occurs to me none of those adjectives will be used to describe tonight's debate. But it's a wonderful uh, kind of opportunity for us to sit back and think about these kinds of ideas. But what's most important to me as an educator is most important to me uh, as uh, really just a citizen is that we are taking these ideas and we're embedding them into our students. Our students are learning about these ideas every day. There are other pathways to think about our future. It's not just what we're going to watch on TV tonight. It's the kinds of ideas and thoughtfulness that we've had here today that just really launches the next generation of leaders, the next generation of Americans and lawyers that we really think can make a difference. And so last but not least, I have to thank the Goldwater family for making this event possible. Um, and for uh, really just our entire philanthropic community for really helping us throw off uh, these kinds of events. We hope to do a lot more of them. I hope to see you at all of them coming forward. Thank you to everyone for what you did today, and I hope you had a great day. Talk to you.